doing it. Yay. <laughs> Welcome everyone to this class. It is a very interesting story. And the story, not many people know about this story. It's really um, something that I want to address because Varian Fry probably is a name that no, not many people know about. But people know about Chagall, Duchamp, and Max Ernst. And probably they do not know how they came to the US, to the US during World War II. So we have this moment in Marseille, in France, 1940. It's exactly the moment when the Nazis occupied occupy part of France, they occupy Paris, and a lot of people go to this port. It is still a place where people can manage to get out somehow, but of course, more and more, the danger comes into Marseille. And we have this man, Varian Fry. This man was gonna be the hero of the story. I don't know if some of you have heard of him, but I guess that his story got muted somehow after many, many years. But at the time, he is a member of an institution that was founded just for this, to help people out of Europe. And it's called the ERC, the Emergency Rescue Committee. Their goal is to take as much intellectuals as they can to help them out to get out of Europe during the time of war. So it's the elite of the society and they feel that they need to help them out. Varian Fry is also going to be part of the US consulate. So he's going to work with the US consulate in Marseille and he's gonna have a lot of uh, people who are rooting for him, but it's not a very big committee. It's a few people who are interested in doing that. And they have, of course, the funding of um, uh, the, 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 um, the president's um, wife, Ruth Eleanor Roosevelt. I don't know if you've seen this Netflix series, Transatlantic, and it became kind of a controversial series. I think it was a very good movie. Uh, it was very well done. It is about the story, and at least people got to know the man, Varian Fry, and what he did for these people. It is based on a book called The Flight Portfolio by Julie Oringer. It is a novel, of course, it is a novel, but it is based on a true story. So that was that is why it was criticized because it was novelized, because some things are invented. But it, the atmosphere is so well made. So I'll refer to this movie in certain occasions as you're gonna see. You don't have to see it or watch it to understand what I'm talking about today but you're gonna see some references to that movie because I think it's really very well made. Where does the name of the book come from? It comes from this portfolio of lithographs that is gonna be called Flight. And it was published in 1971 to raise money for the International Rescue Committee. And what uh, happened in this project is that they got involved uh, artists who were rescued by this committee at the time. One of them is Chagall, of course, Wilfredo Lam. We have many others that were also part of this project that made lithographs like Lipschitz, who is best known for his sculptures. Also, we have André Masson, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about him. And Alfred Barr at the time was the director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York with his wife, Margaret Scolari Barr. They are interested in helping out all of those artists to get them out of Europe as soon as they can. As I mentioned, 1940 and the Nazis are already in France and time is really of the essence and they have to do something. So Alfred Barr gets money to help out this committee and to help Varian Fry to do his job. Until 1942, they still get people out of Europe. And here we have a photograph afterwards of this artist that were in exile already in New York, 1942. We have artists like Leonora Carrington. We see also Max Ernst, where we have a picture of Andre Breton, the leader and theorist of the Surrealist. We also see Jimmy Ernst, who is the son of Max Ernst. Peggy Guggenheim, who helped also to bring out many of those intellectuals. Marcel Duchamp, who is gonna become a very good friend and advisor of Peggy Guggenheim. 
Pierre Mondrian, and I didn't mention Leger, who's sitting right here, and many others. But this is a very interesting picture where we have all of those artists coming from Europe and their refugees in the US. So Varian Fry, we go back to the hero of the story, this man who's going to become the man of the hour. He's going to be helped out by Miriam Davenport. And Miriam Davenport, she was an American former art student at the Sorbonne. So she is in Paris at the time. She gets to Marseille also in 1940 to help out this um this committee. We have also Iran Bingham the fourth, who is the descendant of Iran Bingham the third, who is the discovered, who, who is the one who discovered Machu Picchu. So he comes from this cultural family, and he is going to become one of the vice president, vice consuls in Marseille, the American vice consul. So again, we don't have a lot of people working with Marianne Fry, but the people who are there, they're committed to their goal. And then we have another person, Mary Jane Gould. She was from Chicago. She was an heiress. She was a lover of the arts and the good life. She was in Paris at the time. She was living in France. And also she gets to Marseille at that time in 1940. And he gets she gets in touch with Varian Fry. They figured that they need a place where they can put all of those intellectuals before taking them out of Marseille. And they rent out a house, a villa, which is gonna be called Villa Herbel. And this is a photo taken in 1964 when Varian Fry it went back to Marseille. In 1970, this this um, um, house was demolished. But in the movie, we see it recreated pretty much the same as it was during the war. So we find that these um, men and women who worked with Varian Fry are re really very, very important and they were very courageous. One of them is Albert Otto Hirschman. He was uh, from Germany, he was Jewish. He was a political activist. He went to Spain during the Civil War. He was also uh, very um, openly active politically and against Mussolini's dictatorship. He would speak out about it. And he would have him later on after the war interpreting from one of the accused German uh, officers uh, in one of the trials in 1945, I'm sorry. So he also is going to later on come to uh, the US. Hirschman is going to enlist two different people. Hans and Lisa Pitko, who were also anti-Nazi activists. Here we have him, Hirschman, uh, in a picture. But in 1941, in June, there is a um, raid in the villa. And the police came into the villa where all of those intellectuals were. And this is the moment when he's going to uh, flee to the, through the Pyrenees. And he goes to Lisbon, and then he comes to New York. He find, and finally, <clears throat> he's going to join the US Army Intelligence Section and he's going to be a Princeton University teacher. He's going to be an author of many books and also on political um, economy and political ideology. So this man is also a hero. He would get people out through the Pyrenees, uh, to the Pyrenees, um, to get out uh, from the border and get into Portugal and later on to go to America. Andre Breton as I mentioned, is the leader and theorist of the Surrealists. He's going to also live in this villa and he will have photographs from that moment. As you can see, they will try to have a normal life until they were waiting to have visas to go out of Europe, to go out of France. And they would invite over other friends that were also in Marseille. So he would have a picture of Varian Fry in the center Andre Breton on one side, Jacqueline Lamba, who was married to Andre Breton, also Jack Harold. We're going to talk a little bit about all of those intellectuals, Wilfred Olam, the artist, Daniel Benedict, and many others like Jack Lipschitz, which we don't see in this photograph, Walter Benjamin, who later is going to die, he's going to kill himself, Anna Arendt, Claude Levi Strauss, Franz Werfel, Alma Mahler Werfel, Leon Fetchwanger. So we're going to talk more about the artists, sculptors, and painters, more than the intellectuals like uh, and, and writers. But I want to mention some of them. Some of, of them, uh, we don't have pictures of them in the house, but we know that there's a large list of anti-Nazi writers, avant-garde artists, musicians, and they were all 
wanted by the Gestapo. So they needed to get out. One of them was Sylvan Itkin. He was an actor, he was also a director, and he comes to Marseille in 1940. He stays there for two years and he's going to be a, a very well-organized man. So he's going to found the Croquefruit so the workers have a cooperative to employ the refugees to have food, to sell something, to trade. He's gonna join the resistance and finally he's gonna get killed by the Gestapo. So not, not all of the people who got into the villa are gonna be saved. Some of them like Itkin are gonna die just fighting or because they didn't have any luck and they couldn't get out on time. So this is how Marseille looked at the time. It is a port, as I mentioned. So of course, many of those artists who get visas are gonna get out with uh, with ships, but many others are, have to walk through the mountains, through the Pyrenees, to walk to the other side, to walk through the borders. And Andre Breton, we have many stories that are, um, actually some of them wrote later about the stories in the villa. One of them is Andre Breton. Varian Fry wrote, wrote also in his autobiography about this moment, but on the first day when Andre Breton comes into the villa, he brings with him a bottle of live praying mantises and he puts them all together on the dining room table. And imagine this insects all running around on the table. But of course he was a surrealist. So you can imagine what was going on on that, on, on that villa, all, all of the parties that they would do. For the surrealists, the mantis is like a totem. It's like this icon of this female uh, insect who devours the male after mating. Also for the surrealists, all of those insects that have to do with sex and death, but at the same time it has an anthropomorphic form. And for Andre Masson, who actually kept a lot of them in his house and he raised them, those insects, as he would say, were admirable. And this is a drawing by Andre Masson of the spring mantis. So the photographs that we're seeing here are from that moment when they are at the villa. Wilfredo Lam in the center, I mentioned also uh, Elena Hosler Lam, who was married to Wilfredo, Jacqueline Lamba married to Andre Breton. And we see also Oscar Dominguez, Jack Harold on the back and many others like uh, Marcel Duchamp. He's going to come to the villa. And he later is going to become a very good friend of Peggy Guggenheim also. He's his art advisor, uh, her art, art advisor, I'm sorry. Marcel Duchamp made this art piece for Peggy Guggenheim. It's called Boat and Valise or a box in a valise or in a suitcase. It is a Louis Vuitton, it's a traveling case. And he's going to make 69 reproductions of his own work. One of them is his fountain, very famous, of course, here in miniature, which he had done as a ready-made in 1917, a very famous, of course, fountain, which is actually a urinal, which probably many of you know about. And he's going to get out, thanks to Brian Fry in 1942 on the ERC through uh, with a hospital boat. It's called the Maréchal Layotte, and he came, he came to the U.S., because of the help of Marcel Duchamp, but also of Peggy Guggenheim. When he comes to New York, he is going to help out Peggy Guggenheim in designing some of the exhibitions in her gallery, The Art of the Century. And here we have a photograph of one of those exhibitions where he put string uh, all around the exhibition and he put children playing around and just skipping rope. And if anybody would ask them something, they would say, Mr. Duchamp told us we could play here. Of course, this is a surrealist aspect of Duchamp's work. And when he was at the villa, he also was at, at, alongside Andre Breton, which we see here. And we see Peggy Guggenheim in the center. So in 1941, in the spring, she visited the Villa Air Bell. Fry, Varian Fry is going to write about this moment on his autobiography, which is called Surrender on Demand. And he's going to describe how she came in and she was wearing, some, and I'm quoting, 
long crescents from the, the, some earrings. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I'm quoting long crescents from the ends of which hung tiny framed pictures of Max Ernst. And by the way, I couldn't find those exact earrings, but I did find this photograph of Peggy Goenheim wearing earrings designed by Yves Tanguy. And these are the, the, the earrings that Yves Tanguy designed for Peggy Goenheim. So something similar, but with Max Ernst paintings on them. It's rather interesting that we can find the picture of her and also the art piece at the same time. So Peggy Goenheim, at that time, she had a gallery in London, by the way. She The, the war starts and she gets to Paris and she goes in this buying spree and she knew about all of those art dealers who were Jewish, who were fleeing, or also artists who were coming out of Paris ahead of the Nazis' arrivals. They knew they were coming. And she says in her memoir that she bought a picture a day. So of course she got all of this um, paintings and sculptures for her own collection today in the Guggenheim uh, in Venice. Some of them usually travel to New York as well. So she's going to also help out with money for the crossings with ships um, of many artists and um, the transatlantic. That's why also the name of the series of the TV series on Netflix. This photograph also in the villa, we have uh, Andre Masson, we see also Max Ernst. Again, we see Andre Breton with Jack Lamba, and we see Jacqueline Lamba and also Varian Fry all together in this villa. Here we have a photograph of Max Ernst, who was also a part of this group when they came. But before that, Max Ernst was in a detention camp because he was German. It's called Lemil. It was an old factory which was made into a detention camp. And because he was German, it was thought maybe he was a spy. So he is detained right here. Finally, he gets out and he's going to manage to go to the Villa Erbel. And he wears this white sheepskin coat. And here we have a photograph later on when he goes to New York with Peggy Guggenheim with the Kachina dolls that he had in his collection and probably wearing one of the coats uh, owned by Peggy Guggenheim. We know also that Max Ernst later is going to marry Peggy Guggenheim, but at the time he was in love with Leonora Carrington. And this painting that we see right here, which was done by his friend, um, it's really interesting. Hans Belmer was also incarcerated at the meal in this uh, internment camp. And he paints his friend in profile. At the same time, he does his skin as a wall of bricks because this is the factory where they were at in Le Mille. And they were both prisoners there because they were undesirable foreigners. And here is a, a photograph uh, of the factory that was made out of bricks, the same as the face of Max Ernst painted by Hans Bellman, who was also um, freed from this um, internment camp and came to Marseille to the villa. And I mentioned about the Netflix series because I want you to see how well the atmosphere was portrayed in this um, series. Hans Bellmer here is working with some dolls because his work was done with it. He would just tear apart the uh, dolls like this one and he would make sculptures out of them. I'm going to show you a photograph of him um, later on with one of his works. Again, we see that when, uh, even though it is fictionalized and that series Transatlantic was criticized because of that, at the same time, it's, it, put, it, it puts a spot, um, I'm, I'm sorry, it puts a uh, 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 Varian Fry and the story on, on the on the spot. So we know about him or Belmer, which probably people don't know about him. And he will have his sculptures, the machine gunners in a state of grace. Again, surrealism was part of this group um, calling. Another photograph is still from the movie because we can see a lot of things here because when Max Ernst came into the villa, he brought also a roll of his paintings and 
all of them were put on the walls of the villa when he came in. And he would have a rec recreation of some of the collages that he brought with him. Not exactly that one. I'm showing you one of that, that is a photo montage called the Chinese Nightingale. But also we have other works of art by other artists like this very famous sculpture already made by Marcel Duchamp, the bottle rack, which is considered to be the first pure ready-made that Marcel Duchamp made in 1914. But also we see here that it has a sexualized nature because for Marcel Duchamp, first of all, he's questioning the notion of art. What is really art? And what is an object? And if you take an object, a normal object out of context and put it in a different place, then you have a different idea. The original that Duchamp used in 1914 was destroyed, probably was mistaken as garbage, of course. But here he is taking this bottle rack with an idea of Freudian sexual uh, nature. The male genitalia is this bachelor that it is all of those, uh, the part of the rack, that, that bachelor is missing the bottles that you're going to put on that bottle rack. So of course, you have to think out of the box to understand Marcel Duchamp. Again, we see other references to Marcel Duchamp's work, like this one here called Why Not Sneeze Rose Salavi. He called this kind of ready mates uh, actually called them assisted ready mates He put white marble cubes. They look like sugar cubes, a mercury thermometer, a piece of cuddle bone, and a tiny porcelain dish. And he just puts a title and makes us think, what is this all about? Max Ernst, when he comes to New York, he brings, of course, his paintings. He will have him later in the gallery owned by Peggy Guggenheim. They were married for four years. And uh, here we have a painting called The Kiss. Rather interesting to see that this painting was actually inspired by his um, his his wife, his second wife, actually. Uh, Peggy Guggenheim was his third wife, Mary Berth Orange. And it was this erotic subject matter of the kiss. And on the other hand, he would like to, to paint things by chance. It is called the kiss, of course, but he would get string and he would just drop it on the surface as a chance effect, how the string would just drop on top of that surface. And then he would just see figures that the string would uh, just make. Uh, so you can find a face right here, another face, uh, part of the leg, a foot on the side, a bird right here. And of course, again, we see those sexual undertones in this painting. But during their stay at the Villa Herbel in Marseille, the artists would entertain themselves and they would draw, they would paint, they would play. And this one, for example, is a collective drawing by different artists, Andre Breton, Victor Browner, Wilfredo Lam, Oscar Dominguez, Harold and Lamba all worked together in those drawings that you see on your left hand side while they were in Marseille in 1940. And Andre Breton invented a technique called automatism. The idea was to just write whatever comes into your mind, channeling all the, your subconscious thoughts through art. And he will have a photograph made by Man Ray when they were recording a wake, waking dream sand session. So they would play games like that when they were at the villa. Again, I make a reference to the movie, the series, because they would have those word games. And you can only imagine the uh, surrealist artist just playing and waiting because they have a lot of time on their hands just waiting for the visas to come out. Again, we see a reference where we find what they call exquisite corpse. And those are designs that were also part of a game. So the idea is that you have a paper, you fold it into four or five pieces, and each one of the artists are going to put a part of the body uh, without seeing the rest. And this one on the right-hand side is one of them, made by Yves Tanguy, Jean Mio, 
Max Maurice and Man Ray, and it's called, of course, Cadaver Exquisite or Exquisite Corpse in English. And on the wall, on that movie, you find those ideas as well. So we have that game came from the 19th century parlor games. Artists like Victor Bronner would paint during their stay at the villa. And this title, Air Bell, of course, comes from that moment. The eerie profile of this figure where we have hair coming out of her chin, uh, the egg that she's holding on her, um, on, on her pants, a very interesting character like this, a figure, snake-like figure, but anthropomorphic face and a castle in the back. So it, it is a reference to their stay in the Villa Herbel, but at the same time, they are true to their surrealism. On the other hand, we see a self-portrait by Victor Browner uh, made in 1931. So this is before the war. I just want you to see this because it's really interesting that he's painting himself without an eye. Afterwards, in 1938, he had a fight with Dominguez and he threw a, a glass and uh, to him. Somehow it ended up in his eye and he lost his eye. And probably this is a premonition in 1931 when he made this self-portrait. And here we have him in the villa with Jacqueline Lamba. They are sitting down, uh, just passing time, Browner and Lamba at the Villa Air Bell. Another painting by Victor Browner, who came <clears throat> from Romania also, he ended up, as I mentioned, at the villa. And he had met uh, Breton in Paris, and he joined the Surrealists in 1930. Later, she, he's going to marry Jacqueline Abram in 1938. He goes to Paris. He's in Paris at the time of the occupation. He goes to Perpignan, and he will keep in touch with the Surrealists. As time goes by, I will have, I'm showing you another painting of him. He gets, he gets a permission to settle in Marseille, but he's very, very ill, and he's hospitalized. He goes to a clinic called Paradis, and then he travels to Switzerland. After the war, he returns to Paris. So not all of those artists who were at the Villa got visas, not all of them went out of Europe. Some of them had different stories like Browner in this case, but he survived. While they were at the Villa, they're gonna play chess. The Surrealists love to play chess. And actually uh, we have designs of those uh, board games by Marcel Duchamp. Here we have Marcel Duchamp was an excellent chess player. We have one here. I'm going to show you another scene of they are um, also um, working, well, I mean, uh, playing another design by Marcel Duchamp. But also we have a photograph of Marcel Duchamp playing with Dali in this amazing photograph uh, with a glass um, and they are playing on top of it. This is a, a, a very interesting picture, but they were very good friends. Another design made later by Max by Max Ernst because they were really good uh, chess players and they would spend their time playing chess while they were at the villa. And and I'm showing you this photograph of a still from the Netflix movie where you have Jacqueline uh, and Andre Breton. She's showing a tarot card to Varian Fry. So it's not something that they just invented. Here we have a photograph of her at the villa, by the way, but they actually, she actually became uh, an artist on her own right when she separated with uh, from uh, Breton later on. And until this year, actually, she got her first retrospective, retrospective show at the uh, Weinstein Gallery in San Francisco. But we have her with those tarot cards. Why? because they would spend their time also reading their future. And here we have the design of a tarot card game made by them, by the Surrealists. Uh, Andre Breton was studying the tarots of Marseille and he was looking at them and how he's going to take that idea and he's going to make it his own. And each one of the artists are going to 
have one design of each one of those cards with a surrealist twist, of course. It's going to be called the Jeu de Marseille or the Game of Marseille. They reinvent the iconography of the tarot. Uh, so it's also very playful and it's going to be published in 1943. Later on, it's going to be um, republished in 1983 and it's going to be edited by André de Manche. So I'm going to show you some of the examples of that tarot uh, card game. Victor Browner designed this one, this uh, and the Connoissance. And we see that there's um, the idea of a card, but at the same time, it's a drawing. We see a jaguar. You have the double face right here. Another uh, face with uh, the the uh, the her blonde hair. And then we have another design by Max Ernst, which is his, a historical character. This figure is Pancho Villa, the revolutionary man from uh, Mexico. And it is the bloody will of the revolution. So again, we have a combination of characters, of figures that are poets, historical figures, um, writers, and whatever came to mind. So we find uh, also one very important figure, which is Per Ubu, which is gonna be the Joker. Per Ubu or Father Ubu, it is, uh, it is drawn from this play called Ubu Roi by Alfred Jarry, who in the 19th century, late 19th century, is going to publish this play. And this character who is Ubu Roi, or the King Ubu, it is this laughable character who is a bourgeois, but it is a very, very dumb character. It is a proto dadaist play, and the surrealists would draw on that. They would be inspired by this character. And also we see this painting by Mike Ernst of Ubu Imperator. So this is the Emperor Ubu. So for him, he wanted to free people from any false rationality, from any limits of the society, of the structures, of the customs. And he paints this Ubo Imperator, which is very similar as the one by Alfred Jarry. So we only see this uh, developing in many of the surrealist artists. Another photograph of the villa with Jack Harold, Andre Breton, Oscar Dominguez. So it seems like these photographs were taken, all of them in one day. And here we have one design by uh, Dominguez, where we have Freud. Of course, one of the main characters for the surrealist was Freud and his writings. The idea of Freud and the black star of the dream is part of this Jeu de Marseille or game of Marseille. Do Dominguez actually is going to invent a technique called the calcomania. He's going to take the technique from Russia, but he's going to use it more often. And it, it works perfectly well with the idea of automatic painting or automatic drawing. You use some kind of an ink, you put on top of it um, paper or a canvas, and whatever figure comes out is rather um, aleatory. You don't really control it. So what we have is that Max Ernst is going to take that technique of the calcomania and he's gonna take it into a different level and he's going to develop it in a beautiful way. So he was influenced by Dominguez and he will have a painting using the calcomania, but at the same time, combining it with uh, paintings and drawings. So he uses a technique for the texture and then all of a sudden you see figures coming out. Another of those uh, designs for the cars was done by Jacques Harold. Also, he is going to collaborate for this uh, game, La Miel de Seren de Revolution. La Miel, actually, the name La Miel comes from the, um, the novel, uh, unfinished novel, by the way, by Stendhal. And the main character is La Miel. Again, we see that their inspiration comes from different places. I'm showing you just the kind of paintings that he would do apart from that collaboration of the card game. 
like this one on the right hand side that's called night game done in 1936. Another design, this is by Jacqueline Lamba, The Flame of Love, Baudelaire. So you see now a poet right here, a design by the wife of André Breton. And she, as I mentioned, is going to become an artist on her own right, uh, also a surrealist artist, as you can see here, a uh, very subtle palette, very, very, uh, I would say, very soft palette as, as well. Or this one by André Breton. La religieuse portugaise, Seren d'Amour, or Flame. Stendhal, this is also the inspiration comes from Stendhal, said, one has not loved until they have loved like the Portuguese nun. And this is where André Masson takes his inspiration from. And then we have this, that also designed by André Masson, of the symbolist poet Novalis. And we have that they would play with it. After a while, they have different designs, and we have an artist, another surrealist artist, Frederic de Lagdal, who's going to design all of the back of the cards, and he's going to standardize all of them so they can publish them. So he would draw a continuous line in all of them. So I, I showed you some of them before being published, some of them after were published. And here we have uh, the Langlade uh, design on the right-hand side. He was taken prisoner in 1940. And he manages to escape and goes to the Villa Herbel in Marseille. Uh, uh, another one of those artists who were saved at the time. He had studied psychiatry in Paris and he paints the walls of the hospital right there. He is also in 1943, he does not, he does not manage to get out of France, but he is going to hide with a friend, the Dr. Gaston uh, Ferdier in a psychiatric hospital where Antonin Artaud, by the way, also a surrealist, was staying. After the liberation of Paris, he comes back to Paris. So as you see, they would be together for a while. And in uh, Byron Fry's memoir, he would relate to those Sunday afternoons where they would be um, gatherings. Not all of the people were staying at the villa, but the Bretons would host kind of parties and they would, of course, be the regulars who would drop in every Sunday and they would be all together. A reference again on the, um, on the film, where we can see that they would have dinner parties and they would dress up, they would uh, have masks, they would have uh, different hats, etc. But not all of them are invented. These are pictures from those gatherings. They would go to the fountain outside the villa. They would play games, as you can see here. And here again, uh, the film, they are preparing the tree and the whole uh, place for a party that they were having. So the director here, inspired, of course, by true events, they put eyes because the eye for the surrealist was very important. And we have a drawing by Max Ernst using a technique called frottage. And the idea is to rub on top of a surface that is rough and get the texture out of it uh, with, of course, the paper on top of it. And then you have uh, some kind of, of, of uh, pencil or any other kind of instrument to have the rubbing and have the texture out. So the eye was important because this is the way to the soul for the surrealist. But we also have pictures of the actual moment when they were decorating the garden of the villa. And here we find these two friends, Danny Benedict and Max Ernst, hanging the pictures painted by Max Ernst, but also by Leonora Carrington. Here we have one by Max Ernst, the very famous painting that he made the attirement of the bride, also bought by Peggy Guggenheim, the um, self-portrait made by Leonora Carrington that he had, and also a painting that Leonora Carrington made of him that we find on top of that tree and many others. So it's rather interesting to see that the, the truth is that they would entertain themselves somehow while they were waiting 
and we find the painting of the attirement of the bride, also called La Toilette de la Marie, hanging on top of the tree. So you see, you see it here without, of course, a frame. Later on, we will see that painting in the Peggy Guggenheim collection. It is supposed to be the depiction of the Nora Carrington, who was the love of, of, uh, of, uh, Mar uh, I'm sorry, of Max Ernst. At the time, Leonard Carrington uh, fled to Spain and she finally comes to the US and later on to Mexico. But supposedly this figure right here, this nude figure with this uh, owl-like cape, supposedly is a representation of Leonora Carrington. She's attended by this other naked figure right here. And on the, and here we have a photograph of Max Ernst with Leonora Carrington before, of course, before coming into the villa. But also, um, he painted himself as this bird, Lop Lop. He's kind of his alter ego, which we see also here on the left hand side as this auto, uh, uh, like self portrait of, uh, of Max Ernst. Andre Breton is portrayed in the Netflix series wearing these goggles and a piece of paper. But actually, it comes from this photograph that uh, Andre Breton took of him before, many years before, also part of his performances that he would do, this Dadaist and later Surrealist performances. And this photograph was done by Man Ray. Another reference to the movie, because I like seeing things that are accurate. And probably they did not have this kind of party right there, but they did use some of the hats and dresses that probably were um, uh, inspired by actual designs that were surrealist, like Elsa Schiaparelli's famous uh, hat shoe, or also uh, here we have her in, uh, wearing her hat shoe. And here we have the mannequin done by uh, Dali wearing the hat shoe as well. And this one, which is a bra, also designed by Elsa Schiaparelli, that it resembles a little bit of the dress with those gloves that uh, the character here is wearing. Or this other, where we have uh, an actor impersonating Victor Browner and Marcel Duchamp. They are all dressed up with costumes. And again, we see the eye because Victor Browner, remember, he had lost his eye, an eye. Uh, Victor, Victor, because uh, Dominguez had thrown a glass and it ended up in his eye. On the other hand, he will have a photograph of him and Marcel Duchamp on the right hand side, who would also dress up as a female character and he would use it as an alter ego. And he called himself, when he would dress up, he would call himself Rosa La Vie, also referring to a French phrase called uh, that if you think about it and you hear the sound of it, Eros de la vie, or Eros such is life, or Eros de la vie, to make a toast to life. So he would play with words and he would have him in those photographs where he is dressed as a woman. He made a, he had a, a series of photographs made by Man Ray, dressed as a woman. And many, many of his uh, works are signed with a uh, Rose de la vie name instead of Marcel Duchamp. And he is going to say, and I'm quoting him, I decided that it didn't suffice me, that it didn't suffice me to be a lone individual with a masculine name. I want to change my name in order to change for the ready mates above all, to make another personality for myself. So of course, he's very well characterized here in the film in on, on that transatlantic. Now, Marc Chagall. Marc Chagall had applied in 1933 for French citizenship and he was rejected because when he was in Russia uh, during World War I and later on, uh, he was involved with the Russian government. So when he applied for the French citizenship, it was rejected. Until 1937, he became a citizen. And by the time the war started, he felt protected. He thought that nothing was going to happen to him even though he was Jewish and he was in the Gestapo uh, list. Ooh, something happened here. Okay. So um, he goes to go when Paris is occupied and 
he's going to write about this moment that the rich greenness of the French countryside proved advantage for him and his artistic sense. And here we have a couple of photographs while he is staying in Gorth with his wife. We have a, a picture of him thanking her before, of course, Bella, as you can see them together. Uh, he was painting her until, of course, they came to the U.S. She dies in the U.S. later on. But those pictures that we have, well, he was in Gord working are rather interesting because we have the painting of the three candles and he's in front of it while he's working. The three candles painted with his bright, beautiful colors as we know it. And then we have him here in this photograph when he was visited by Varian Fry, because Varian Fry tries to convince him that he has to get out of France as soon as possible. And they have papers for him. And he, they are here in front of a painting called the Madonna of the Village. In this photograph, Chagall is right here. And here we find uh, Varian Fry on the left-hand side. And this is a painting, the Madonna of the Village, that he was painting while he was in Gore. So one of the final meetings, and this is what Fry tells us, that Fry is, go Fry is going to ask him, uh, uh, to, um, I'm sorry, Chagall is going to ask Fry, are there cows, are there cows in America? And Fry says, well, yes, there are cows in America. And Fry says, I could see from the look of relief on his face that he had already decided to go. And this is how he convinces him. He convinces Chagall to get out of France because there are also cows in America. This is a photograph of uh, he and Bella in 1944 already in the US. And they were the last saved of those intellectuals that Varian Fry managed to get out of France. The only artist who kept in touch with Varian Fry was Jacques Lipschitz, the sculptor. Somehow, this group of artists, uh, even though they were saved by Varian Fry, they thank him, of course, they owe him his their life, but they didn't keep in touch with him. And each one of them have their own careers, their own life. They had to reinvent themselves uh, very often. But Jacques Lipschitz kept in contact with Varian Fry throughout his life. And in um, 1941, Brian Fry is forced to leave France. The ERC and the IRA um, are going to be joining forces and they're going to create another institution, the International Rescue Committee, the IRC. And so it's not only about World War II, it's about any other refugees in the world, the Cuban, the Angolan, the Chinese, the Afghan, they are going to be helped by this International Rescue Committee. In 1964, they are going to tr uh, have a project to fundraise and raise awareness of the plight of refugees. And with a partnership with the Museum of Modern Art, they're gonna make this portfolio called The Flight. But it's gonna be published until 1971, which this is how I started the class. It's gonna be 12 works by many artists who were saved by Varian Fry. Chagall, Lipschitz, Masson, Robert Motherwell. Mother, Motherwell was not saved by him, but I mean, uh, or Alexander Calder, but they got into this project as well. It was uh, published as a limited edition of 250 copies. Uh, and they have been doing, they still work trying to help. And they do have some exhibitions like this exhibition in 2020 with photographs of children, victims of trauma and violence, uh, and wars and political situations in different countries. So they are they do fundraiser fundraising for these causes of to help out refugees. So Varian Fry is the hero of this story, and he managed to save many artists. Max Ernst, which we mentioned, Marcel Duchamp. Also, we find Marc Chagall as one of the last saved Lipschitz, who still kept contact with him. We spoke about Hans uh, Belmer, also Jacqueline Lamba, and Wilfredo Lam, the famous surrealist artist. Again, we have André Masson, and I'm not mentioning all of them, but Oscar Dominguez was also part of it. Victor Browner, 
and we also see Jacques Herald. And I'm not mentioning uh, the rest of them who are writers, who are poets, who were philosophers like um, Anna Arendt or Benjamin Walter, uh, Walter Benjamin and many others. So Varian Fry was uh, probably this man who managed to do this, who was intelligent enough to try to help them out, to get them visas to get out of Europe. And probably if it weren't for this book, which is a novel, or also the Netflix series, not many people would know about Varian Fry. Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, listening to this story. And I hope you had enjoyed this class. And if you have, please, comments, questions, just unmute yourself. Thank you. Super nice. Well, thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Yeah, it is an incredible story. Yes. Yes. And, and I recommend the, the series in Netflix. Yes. It's a series or a movie? It's a series. It's a series. Ah, okay. Yeah, I don't remember how many uh, episodes they have. Uh, at least five or six, I think. But it's very well made. It is, remember, it's, an, it's, it's, it's a novel, but it is based on a true story. Mm -hmm. So don't and forget. Which, but it, which it shows better, it show the book? Yes. Or thank the, you, Barbara. Book. Yes. Uh, he's recognized righteous among the nations, the nations in uh, Yad Vashem. Yes, he is. Yes, he what's is. the name of the series again? Transatlantic. Transatlantic? Transatlantic. It is on Netflix. Yeah. yeah. Which is better, mm -hmm. Bakia, the book or the series? I didn't read the book. I knew about the story already. So if you know already, now that you know about the story, you will get more about the series. Yeah. I think you're going to enjoy it. It's, it's really, really very well made. And I, I, mean, it, I mean, it was really criticized because it's not, not everything is true, but, but really they had, you can enjoy they it. They had to make it interesting, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. But most of it, it is. So it, it, it's very accurate the way they, they put the whole, the whole atmosphere of the place and everything is really very well done. They, they, they did their research. So probably they did not dress like that, but at some point they did. Maybe not in Marseille, but they did. So yes. Well, it's the first time I'm Lolita um, that I participate in any activity of the Sterling Library, and I have thoroughly enjoyed it. I am very glad that I have joined this organization. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Lolita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Spread the word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, will this, unfortunately, I had to be called away and I missed the whole thing except the last two minutes. Um, is this going to be recorded? It, it, it is. It's still recording. It's still recording. It's still okay, recording. So I think uh, <laughs> the Friends of the Sterling Road, uh, they publish it in their YouTube channel, I believe. Yes. Or it mm -hmm. in, a, in a letter, as a newsletter, I, I think so. Yes, it'll it'll be in the newsletter and they'll tell you how to get on. Thank but you. But you can see it. You can see it. Yes. So don't feel bad that you missed anything. Yes. Am I going to receive the newsletter on the email or how? I if hope you, you do. If you, if you registered as, uh, I think that you need to be a member, right, Susan? Yeah. Yes. Do Are you, you have you become a friend of the Sterling Road Library? Lolita? Well, I register, but uh, I really don't know what's the procedure to become a friend. If you okay. will kindly explain. Okay, Lolita, when you come into the library, uh -huh. on the desk, there is a, uh, an envelope. And the envelope says, Friends of a Sterling Road Library Membership. And you okay. can be a member for as little as $10 or as much as you want to give. I always say that. But it's the best $10 you'll ever spend because that money goes to all our programs that we provide for our library community. And this is just an example of the quality of the programs that we do provide. And I will tell you, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I hope you come into the library, you get a schedule and you do that. Okay. I sure will. Thank you. You're very Thank welcome. You. I, I believe that also online, if you go to the Friends of the Sterling Road Library online on the website, 
Uh, also, Rhonda, you're... Yeah, I have a question. I, I did see the series Transatlantic, and I was wondering, how long did they stay there, the artist, in this um, mansion? And did the Germans not know that they were there? They did. Well, some of them stayed for months, um, almost a year, I think, some of them. Uh, yes, they did. They did have a raid, and they had some of them had to flee and escape when the Germans came. Um, but not all of them were, you know, the Gestapo was not, uh, we think they were very organized, but not as organized. So um, I don't think they had the list of everybody who were seeking, who, who they were seeking to, to imprison, but they did raid the villa once and they had to hide and escape. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Go ahead. Who's Eva? Yes. Go ahead. I don't know how to get myself onto the screen, but no, I, we see you. I have something to add. Go ahead. I was one of the 30 docents of uh, the Art and Culture Center when they had the exhibit 250 diplomats who were helping people escape. And wow. among the people saved by Hans Frey, uh, or whatever his first name is, I'm sorry, very Frey. Yeah. Uh, he, he also rescued the couple. They were married to each other, a man and a woman, and I do not remember their name, but the, uh, the series of Curious George, children. Mm. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Right. <laughs> they were the creators of Curious Joy. Correct. They correct. too were among the saved people. Yeah, correct. It, there's a list of uh, about 300 people that he saved. Mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't. I didn't mention all of them. But yes, thank you. You're you're right. Yes. Thank you. Yes, there's a book about that. <laughs> yes. Was at the uh, at the JCC. Uh, uh, um, and he wrote he wrote also his oh, autobiography. Yes. Marion Fry also wrote his autobiography. And there, there are many articles that you can read about and the list of everybody that he saved and that he managed to to get them out of Europe. Yes. yes and it was, I'm not sure when anymore. I'm I'm in my 90s now. I was one of the Holocaust survivors who was uh Wow. A drawn into this uh, exhibit of 250 diplomats. Wow. That's awesome. It very impressive. Very, very Thank interesting. you, Emma. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. One, one of Bing, Bingham was involved in this. The, the, Walter ben Benjamin was also there. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And one of and his Anna family, Arendt and one many of his relatives was there at the mm -hmm. exhibit. Oh, Anissa, I think, a younger Oh, woman. really? That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for sharing Thanks. this. Thank you very much, Marcia. Thank, thank you, Eva. Anybody else who wants to add something or ask anything? Okay. So Just thank you very much. Very enlightening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Excellent thank you program. And Excellent. You very soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. When so will you be back? back? Uh, let me see. I don't remember. Susan, do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I put it in the calendar. I just do. We have to look at the calendar. Is it two weeks or think I think uh, it's on the um, uh, the 14th of November. 14th of November. Okay. Oh, November. November 14th. Yes. Time? What time? 7 p.m. 7 p.m. always. Always, always okay. at 7 p.m. And what is it going to be about? Oh, that's a uh, singer sergeant. A little bit different. Oh, I like singer mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, hope to see you there. Thank you Thank so you. much. Bye. Thank, Bye. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank well. you, everyone, for coming. Be well. Bye-bye, Susan. Bye, Linda. Bye. <laughs>